Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, it's our pleasure to have you. My name is Jen Wilson. I'm the Director of Programming and Advocacy with NEMA. Um, and I'm joined by colleagues um, Heather Riggs and Scarlett Huey. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Camille Breeze and Barrett Keating, who are our, um, our conservation uh, PAG co-chairs. All yours, Camille. Hey, um, I guess because uh, I invited Ann, I'll I'll do the initial talking, but um, Barrett and I, uh, we are furniture conservator in his case and a textile conservator in my case. And right down the line is furniture, upholstered furniture, because yeah. it is both wooden artifact and textile. And so we are very keen to hear what we can from Anne Frasina. Anne and I go back to when I was a teenager, my very first friend in conservation. And um, in her long career trajectory, she's... Um, been a upholstery specialist and now as the textile conservator at the Minnesota Historical Society or History Center. Um, she does everything that the museum needs and um, I think she's really excited to talk about upholstery. And um, so uh, I'm going to invite Anne to just say hello. And um, if you uh, don't have anything prepared, we will probably jump right into one of these questions and then just organically go on. Well, hello, everyone. It's really glad to meet you all and um, see some of you. And I'm excited to talk with you about this subject matter. It's a super complex subject matter. There are so many different ways that you can go about conservation of upholstery. So yeah, let's start. Okay. Um, Rosamond had a, an interesting question, something I remember talking to you about a lot. How do you assess previous upholstery tack holes to judge how many reupholstering campaigns a piece has gone through? And then uh, there's a second part that I can re repeat later, which is what companies are cur currently making custom reproduction fabrics for museums? That's an interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about that first one. Um, it's a super difficult thing to do, which is to read the tacking edges. They're like an archaeological surface in that you want to, you want to, document the edges after each layer has almost been taken off if you're looking to read them because in that way you can identify what the earlier tack holes are for each layer because you've got your supportive layers underneath and then you've got your show cover over it and then you have your trim over that so when you take that first show cover off you can almost take a nail the nail out and put it back into that original hole and then that will give you an idea as to what holes were there before it. Now, the question is, is this the first campaign of application or the first generation of upholstery, depending on how you refer to it? Um, because as we all know, upholstered items are often um, reupholstered over time. And so it's not uncommon to see as much as six layers of upholstery on a piece. And um, so it's really comes down to if you can put that nail back in the hole, you can identify which ones were earlier. Another way is that the, the holes may be a different shape because it's a different style tack, you know, or there may be a rose head tack, which has like a, like a kind of funny, uh, you know, it's not a flat tack. It's got a, it's got a kind of like a little rosebud at the top of it. So those rosehead tacks are another way to ascertain what's original. And then that size shape hole could identify which holes are that. Something I've done is I've taken little dots and put them near the holes that I think are original and then sat back and looked at it to see if the pattern is consistent. Um, and it's really about experience, I think, more than anything, because reading those edges is extremely difficult to do because you've got oftentimes so many layers. Um, so I think it's down to experience, marking as you go along and identifying which tacks are earliest um, and taking, uh, taking pictures and you can Oftentimes I'll take a piece of mylar and draw out the holes, boom, 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 that I think that are the first 
application and then I can take the next layer off, do the next layer of holes. It's another way of identifying patterns because everyone's got like a distance that they go depending on the fabric and the wood. So um, it's a little, it's complex. You know, it's one of the most complex things you can do. The most important thing you need to do when you're taking off layers of um, later upholstery is to look for those original fragments. Mm -hmm. And they may be as small as two, centi it's two centimeters or two millimeters. They're just, they can be so tiny. Um, but they can give you a wealth of information in terms of weave structure, color, and fiber. Um, you're going to find horsehair fragments more readily than, say, a woolen rep weave because horsehair is just the sturdiest of fabrics and lasts the longest. So um, so it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Experience really helps out a lot. But if you can somehow make a map of what you're seeing and look for the patterns, it can give you insight as to what's ahead of you. The other thing is that sometimes I've heard of people actually tipping things on their sides and using their stereo microscopes to go into the holes. I've never been able to do this, but um, I've always thought it would be a great thing to try. And I think that that's another good option if you have that opportunity to do that. So, um, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else I can add. Does anybody have any questions about that? That was a lot of information and I kind of tumbled it out. So as questions um, the, come in, the other NEMA staff will also let us know. Okay. And then you were asking where to get historic fabrics. Was that yeah. the second question? Yes. Okay. Um, I have used family heirloom weavers in Red Lion, Pennsylvania. They've rewoven simple weave structures for me, like a wool rep fabric that I went on to get dyed by Test Fabrics for um, a suite of furniture at the Ramsey House. And um, those findings are published in a paper I did called The Victorian Eye. And that was a really good um that was a really good moment because of talking about tacking edges because I took off the outer layer and there had been like three applications of show covers. And I finally found the original fragments and they were just three of them and they were just the tiniest of things, but they gave us the weave structure, the color and the um, fiber. Another place that's in U the UK would be Humphreys. They do both silk and wool. I once worked on a beautiful piece of wool damask that they wove um, for us at, uh, it was Spinea at the time, now it's historic New England. And that was beautiful to work with. Um, John Boyd, he does horse hair. And um, as far as horse hair goes, he's your guy. And horse hair, you know, it's that single strand of horse hair tail that comes and goes across the whole whiff, so it's not a very wide fabric, but it's a very hard wearing fabric, probably the hardest wearing fabric of all. And um, that's why we see so much of it. Prell is in France and Prell uh, does mostly silk. That's really pretty much all they do. They have an enormous library of patterns that they have collected as mills have closed. And so, um, and then they also have the documentation as to where they were used. So where the fabric was used, say like Newport, Rhode Island for one, one pattern that we actually used to reproduce fabric here for the, for the Hill House, the James J. Hill House in uh, St. Paul. Um, I'm sure you guys know Kate Smith. She's in Vermont. You know, if you just need a few yards of indigo fabric, she was a great person to go to. And then um, I also worked with Rabbit Goody of Thistle Hill. Uh, we did a very complex weave structure with her. Um, we reproduced fabric for the um, George, um, George Armitage was the designer's name. He's from Manchester, England very well known in the arts and crafts time period. 
And uh, we took one of his original designs and had it reproduced by Thistle Hill. So it goes to the later 19th century quite well. And um, she's very good. Another place I used to go, but I went online and they don't seem to have it as much are Thai silks, which is just a kind of off the, you know, a, 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 like a dressmaker kind of fabric. But sometimes when you're dealing with these older pieces, the rabbit where all of that nailing goes into isn't very deep. When something is half over the rail and say it has decorative nailings or it has um, a uh, quill tape of some sort, a tape to finish it. So something to think about is dress, don't discount dress fabrics because our modern upholstery is often too fat to fit on some of these earlier 18th century delicate pieces. Um, and also our, our upholstery today is kind of historicized. It's like either too big or it's too small in terms of design. It's just a little funky. So sometimes a dress fabric is not a bad way to go, especially if you're looking for some a silk fabric to go onto, you know, in an aesthetic chair. So something to think about. Lisa, thanks for all those references. I was dropping some links as you were talking, but I know you mentioned your um, your book, the Victorian Eye, or your um, mention of some of the textiles. Would you know where we'd be able to find a link to that? The Victorian Eye is through um, the AIC TSG group, Textile Specialty Group. And so if you go to the TSG portion of the AIC website, type my name into the library search, it should come up. And I think I did it in the early odds. I don't remember the exact year. Okay, great. I might let Camille, you drop that one in. <laughs> right, it's uh, culturalheritage.org is the cl quick answer. That's the website for American Institute for Conservation. Um, and I was just um, revisiting a proposal I made in 2017 and the company that we identified for a silk satin was called um, Silk Duchess in the UK. Um, I haven't revisited that since 2017 but I wondered if you'd heard of them I have not but you know I'm not working exclusively on upholstery so I'm not as heavily involved in it as I was in the past I do work here but not continuously on upholstered items mm -hmm. but um so do they give a lot of different colors I think I, I haven't revisited it. I, I literally just was asked about it today. So I don't I don't really know. Um, but the color that we needed was this very um, luscious copper penny color. And mm -hmm. um, that's not something you'd find anywhere. So I'm thinking that, um, you know, when I, I'm going to put these together in a list and I'm going to revisit Silk Duchess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you can find it dyed and, and ready to go, that's great. Um, you know, I used to work with this incredible dyer here in Minnesota, Marlis Jensen. She dyed for uh, the Textile Museum to do fabric for their uh, cases and other people within the conservation community, as well as operas and movies. And she was a fabulous dyer and she just retired. And I'm so sad because I don't know where to go now for those individual colors that, you know, are sometimes hard to find. Mm -hmm. So if anybody knows of anybody who's dying, please let me know. Great. Um, so a couple of notes from the chat. Um, Camille, thank you for dropping that link in there. And Margaret um, said that Marla also died for the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco too. Yes, yeah, she's multiple museums in the country and she's the kind of person, she'd look at something and mix the dye formula in her head. And you only get that by doing dyeing like every day for years. I can dye, I can go back and I can, I can do it. I can triangulate a color, but it's very long process for me because I don't do it on a regular basis. Marlis just had that incredible eye to mix a color in her head and have it come out pretty much what she wanted it to be. Thank you, that was really interesting. 
Um, I'm going to go down the line to the next question, which says, would you wash cotton and polyester service curtains, i.e. not accessioned, um, that have insects and other staining, would you do that differently than you would for an accessioned set of curtains? It depends on how they're fabricated. If they have insets with um, thread work or... I insect. Oh, insect, excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, if they're plain curtains that there's literally like no tape or pleats at the top, then, um, you know, I would try washing them with Orvis. I wouldn't use a surfactant off the shelf. And the reason is, is because there are optical brighteners in those softeners. And what they can do is deposit onto the white fabric. I had this happen to me once in an uneven kind of splotchy manner. And then all of a sudden you put it up to the light and it fluoresces differently than what's next to it. So I would always recommend going to a base surfactant like Orvis or Triton XL, whatever you are comfortable using. Um, in terms of getting rid of spots, uh, this is something I'm working on quite a bit. We just started studying the stain um, removal system that I was I took a class on at um, NATCC. Okay. So um, stain removal, what we're finding is, is that if we can match the pH to the pH of the stain, we have a lot more movement than before. So stain removal is really picky. Um, you know, if it's truly just a reproduction and it's a simple structure, you know, and it, and it's something you can remake easily, it's not an enormous amount of, um, resources to, or money to purchase the fabric, then yeah, I guess I would try it in, um, a front loader on gentle, uh, with a base surfactant. Um, but if you've got pleats or anything like that, if you've got a good dry cleaner in the area, that might be another option for you. But again, um, these would be for non-accessioned items. Can I add something to that? Yes. So here's something we find with wool fabrics. Um, we may know that there was a history of some kind of insect activity and there may be minor damage, but what we can't see is that the insects have left behind enzymes on these fibers. So even if you have a jacket, say you buy it at a secondhand store and then you take it to the dry cleaner, suddenly you'll see more holes and you'll think mm. to yourself that's, you know, they mishandled it. But the truth is that these enzymes that remain behind, they get reactivated during the cleaning process and then you see more loss. So we sometimes have to tell our clients, um, yeah, I can work with the conservation dry cleaner, but you know, I see these four holes, there might be eight holes when we're done, you know, there's things to, to, to know. So anticipate that and um, you know, make sure that you, all the members of your team are prepared for the fact that um, cleaning might visually at least seem like a step back in that, in that one way. Yeah. Um, of course, dye bleed is the other thing that we, um, we test for ahead of time. Not hard. You can use paper towel, drop a water paper towel. You don't have to have fancy blotter paper. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, you would always want to test like something like that. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I probably wouldn't try to do this with something that was printed or, um, a multi, uh, multicolored, uh, woven item either. I probably would focus on just something white and have it be something that could be easily replaced. If you've invested a lot of money in it, then it's worth investing some money going to a good dry cleaner or going to a conservator. And it, it's funny because, you know, when we do this reupholstering and when we do this uh, soft furnishings inside, we spend a lot of money on these fabrics because they're often very specific. And for that reason, we really, you know, you almost are beholden to treat it more carefully because of the cost of replacement. So it almost puts it at the level of an artifact, but not quite there. And um, you touched on something that is another question, which is, um, is there a favorite solvent or surfactant for removing stains in white cotton textiles? Uh, I Well, like I said, I usually use Orvis because like I said, the, the uh, surfactants that are on 
in the you know, that you go to the store and buy, they all have these optical brighteners in there. And optical brighteners attach like a dye molecule. Once they're there, they're there. You cannot get rid of them. They will not wash away. Um, in terms of stain removal, I think, you know, it's best to go to a conservator or to, if it's not a very special piece, if you've got a good dry cleaner, that could be a possibility too. But um, I mostly go to pH um, involvement and, you know, altering the pH of the solution. That's what I really want to go to when I'm looking at stains at this point in time. In other words, it's really complex. I would go to Anne and ask her opinion. Um, I, have a res I have a handout on my website, museumtextiles.com, under resources for um, bleaching with sodium borohydride. And that's mm -hmm. in sort of the advanced topic section. So if you're a conservator and you have a, a, an amount of white things that you need to work on, you can get that handout off my website. Um, it's not the cheapest thing to get into because the, the, the material itself has to be purchased, but my vendor is on there. And um, so like uh, our friends here in historic New England, that's something that you could undertake with um, you know, just uh, consulting with a, a textile conservator because you know you have um, the right kind of water and the right kind of setup and um, you, you wash other things. So that would not be uh, a difficult thing for you to, to do. Yeah, I mean, there's, that's a really good point, the water. Oh my God, the water. So mm -hmm. I grew up with well water. So all of our white stuff would come out with a kind of green tinge to it because we had a lot of copper in our water. Um, water also has a lot of rust in it a lot of rust actually. Um, and you don't see it at first. It deposits, then it oxidizes, then it creates a stain. Um, so water is a really big thing. Um, again, uh, you want to, you know, if you're working on a piece that is coming um, from a more use, it, it's been reproduced, it's not an original, it's another reason to be careful with something that's more expensive, like a lace from John Burroughs or something like that. What do you think about um, any kind of spray or protectant to put on upholstery? I think it's not a good idea and this is why. Um, what they put in those sprays is a proprietary formula and we don't know what it is. Um, you're also putting something um, on a historic fabric that is a chemical. And we don't know how it's going to, because we don't know what's in it, react long term or age, you know, or change as it ages, I should say. Not that aging is bad, but things catalyze with the humidity in the air and can sometimes create a bigger problem. So I don't recommend that people use like scotch guard or anything like that um that stuff also off gases and you know sometimes that could influence say the nails on a furniture it's, it's just something that we wouldn't go for because if you're spraying it on you're probably going to get it on the nail heads it could change the patina on the nails which would be another problem um, that would be quite annoying, um, especially if somebody spent a lot of time fuming those nails so that they would have a patina when they were put on. Um, and then all of a sudden say you've got a darker you know, area that's just over the top edge of those nails. It could be visually very disruptive. So I recommend that people cover furnishings with um, slick surfaces, um, a slick fabric like Bemberg Ran. You know, when something is not on exhibit and you've got a historic house that's closed up for the for a period of time, I find a dust cover is really your best friend. And then, of course, gentle vacuuming, gentle surface cleaning in a controlled row by row, step by step manner is another way to remove um, surface accumulation such as dust and particulates and things like that. I had an experience recently where I was uh, spot cleaning upholstery in C2 in a, in a house and uh, the upholstery itself all over was dirty. So yeah. when I took, you know, even just a drop of water to a little stain, I ended up making a cleaner ring because there were too many just latent soils there. So um, 
that's another reason to be super cautious about uh, approaching anything, even with water, is that you're not just talking about moving soils, I mean, moving dyes and things like that, but you, you can make all these stains look worse. That's a very common problem for us. <laughs> it is. It's a huge, like spot cleaning in itself, it's always, you know, I always want to do a general overall, overall cleaning versus just doing the spot because um, like she said, you get these clean areas and then they pop, they just pop. Um, the other thing that can happen sometimes when you clean upholstery is that you remove the patina of the particulate that's there and the, the water soluble soils. And then all of a sudden you see the stains, you know, and they weren't visible before. So cleaning is always, when you're using water, a very, very tricky business. Very tricky. Yeah. Hey, Barrett, what would something like Scotchgard do to the wood that is adjacent to an upholstery fabric? Oh, it's it's sort of what Ann said. You know, it's a nightmare no matter where you put those those chemicals. Um, they are proprietary, and, and we don't know what's in them, even though you can request an SDS where they're supposed to give you the ingredients. It seems like today they everybody just sends you an SDS form that by law they're supposed to tell you the ingredients, you know, the chemical ingredients of the of the proprietary right. solution and and there's nothing in it. You know, it's just these generalities. So um yeah, it's gonna add a film that could be deleterious to depending on how compromised the the finish is on the piece. If it's an old compromised shellac, um it could definitely attack that. Um, it, it adds another layer that we have to take off in the cleaning process when we're removing, um, you know, like polymerized um, linseed oil layers and complex dirt layers that have been there hundreds of years. And, and now we've got something on top of that that are modern chemicals that just complicates the thing. So, yeah, I, I agree with Ann. Just stay away from all of that stuff. And my biggest beef i guess with all of those things are um is the off gassing any of those those new materials are constantly you know in living spaces i think people mm -hmm. buy modern furniture and they they think oh this sounds great to you know i have kids i have dogs and and let's let's uh scotch card this thing as we buy it and we won't have to worry about this and now you've got something else in the house you know besides the carpets and the paint and everything else that's off gassing into the environment where we're all locked up all winter long breathing all of these these chemical fumes so yeah i'm totally against it <laughs> the next question we have from Catherine o'donnell has to do with repair versus replace and whether there's a methodology that you prefer to use and when you're approaching to um a conservation of an upholstery you know it really t depends on the intent and the rarity of the upholstery and um, the goals of the institution. Um, when we had um, family heirloom reweave wool rep for us for the Cortina set of upholstery in the parlor of Ramsey House, we did that because there was nothing left of the original. And at some point the DAR had upholstered everything in a pink damask in the 50s so it was like kitty it's what i call kitty cartwright upholstery you know it's like it's like bonanza or something it's like somebody's ideal of upholstery and um you know once we went back to the original upholstery it changed the entire look of the entire suite of furniture have so, you ever have you ever used a digitally reprinted fabric for upholstery I have, and I, it's sort of pluses and minuses. Um, I did use a digitally reprinted piece for um, a pair of wing, wing chair, wing chairs. Um, I guess they're from the later 19th century. They're in the library. And what we did was we took an image, a black and white image, and we transferred that image into a colored print. And then we had it printed on a textured surface. My problem with digital printing is the, is the sharpness of the design. You really um, see the uh, little kind of crenellated dots, you know, those little uh, dots that kind of 
go down to make those lines. And the fact that we didn't print it on a smooth fabric, but a more textured fabric, because we were trying to go for something that was more of a tapestry woven kind of look or a um, jacquard uh, woven textile. Um, it, it just wasn't as clean a design. Um, the other issue with digital printing is that your digital printing, um, and this was a few years back now, so they may have gotten better, but the ink can change, the ink changes, you know, the amount of ink that's in there, in their cases or in their stores, whatever you want to call it, reserves, um, gets sprayed onto the fabric and the fabric moves on. Well, that rate of spray and um, can sometimes change when you're doing a large piece of fabric. And so you can get a slightly different color at one end of the fabric then. So if you need 20 yards and you want it to be consistent, this might be an issue for you. Um, it was an issue for me. I had to take all the fabric and match up which ones would go where so that we could, we wouldn't have disruptive color changes. So, um, but on the other hand, you could also reproduce a design and do an underlay and put the original fabric over it mm. and visually ameliorate the area of loss without creating, um, just kind of make it look whole again without removing the original. So yeah, that is something that can be done. Yeah. Um, so he, there's, there's always applications, but it's getting that technology to work for you and your needs within a, the historic site. Mm -hmm. um, you know, upholstery is so hard because it gets so worn and it's like, well, what am I going to do? You know, if I don't have enough of it left, I have to look for something to replace it at some point. Um, and that's very, very difficult to do. That's why we go to these historic places and spend a lot of money getting fabric rewoven to our specifications. Yeah. We had another really interesting question that I was going to come to. Um, anybody who's done contemporary upholstery, you know that you can buy like a, a, a tool to get tacks out and it kind of looks like a, like a horse's hoof and it's pretty clunky and maybe there's some burrs or sharp edges on it. So. I'm wondering if you could uh, go over sort of what is in your toolkit um, in terms of maybe taking off uh, a layer of fabric that you know is, you know, uh, not original, you've got some records on it, and you're going to see what's underneath. Yeah. Um, you know what I used to pull tacks? Wire cutters. A small pair of wire cutters because they have a pointed end, and you can work it directly under that nail head and use it you know, you get it under the nail head, close down on it, that picks it up a little bit, just the act of closing the jaws, and then you can use it as leverage to pop it up. I find a wire cutter about, you know, this size, you know, not a, not a super large one, not the kinds that have the little holes in them, but the kind that's just like a half moon. I find those are really, really helpful. And I'm sorry, I don't have one here to show you so I can better describe it, but um, like a jeweler would have one of these kind of thing, or you can find a small one at Home Depot or something like that. I don't like the large jaw ones that have the different size holes so that you can strip the wire. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an actual small handheld uh, thing that sp has a spring that opens when you're doing a lot of nail heads, you want it to spring open because your hand gets tired of popping all the uh, tacks off. Um, so that's what I would use. Um, that, a good scissor. Um, I use a stretcher to a certain extent, depending on how fragile the actual textile is. Um, Can you explain that? A stretcher is, oh, no, that is not. No, I thought I had a picture in my in my area. Um, a stretcher is like a pronged item that you can put the webbing onto it and it has like a, a rubberized end. So it's like a claw. You put it under and then you and then you torque it down and it stretches out that fabric that um, webbing evenly. 
So, um, and if you go to any kind of an upholstery site, they have those there. Um, some people also use um, canvas stretching for a uh, canvas uh, for a painting. I never found those very helpful. So I usually use a stretcher and I usually go to a place where it's not on top of the finish. So say I have to put the, the webbing on top of the, I've got a chair seat, I've got the top. I will bring it down to the underneath portion, not the varnished portion to, to um, use that rubber end to create that tension. I don't know if I explained that well. That's a tough one. Do you um, do you mind addressing sort of how you would um, sort of preventively um, protect the area of the fabric around that tack um, from the act of pulling the tack out? Oh, you can you can do that. You can. Um, this is what I like about these little cupped wire cutters. You can get directly under the nail or you can actually go under the whole thing and take it out because the whole thing, by the whole thing, I mean the fragment and the nail head at the same mm -hmm. time. And you oftentimes wanna do that because it's such a small fragment that once you take it off the nail head, you lose some of the weave structure. So um, these fragments are super friable usually, they're super small. Um, Ziploc bags, right? You want your Ziploc bags right there. You want your Ziploc bag ready. And you, if it doesn't release from the rusted nail head, and it's always a rusted nail head, I don't know why. Um, like all the other nails are fine, but the one with the one fragment on it, it's gotta be rusted. So, <laughs> Before you try, if it doesn't release easily, just put the whole thing in the in the bag and leave it there. So you really want to be prepared and have your little baggies lined up. Yeah, so true. Um, I sometimes um, find, especially with something like a staple, if you're taking a staple out, um, mm -hmm. you I sometimes use a micro spatula or a piece of mylar so that when I'm if I'm using leverage, yeah, that um, that barrier can be, be good, but also um, especially with a staple, uh, often just one side of the staple comes up first. And then you, if you're not careful, you can break the one of the feet of the staple off into the thing. And then again, you're sort of digging and trying to get that and working around it. So um, think of it as sort of two different steps. You can pry one half of that staple up and then you really want to go in with maybe a needle nose plier. And um, rather than pull out, you might need to roll it. And then mm -hmm. again, think of whether you're rolling it onto the upholstered surface, onto the wooden surface, you know, how are you going to do that? Sometimes you then take uh, maybe a little screwdriver, and when you go to roll that second half of the staple out, you're rolling it onto another tool. So, uh, you know, these are some of the techniques. Yeah. Because it's not like a regular chair. It's not like upholstering your own chair. It's, it's really. Does anybody um, use Nomex at all, at, at all anymore? Is anybody using Nomex? It's a basically a nylon board that they use within the electrical community to um, create a barrier. And I, I don't know what they use it for. They, it's from the electrical community, but it's a nice board and you cannot rip it. You have to cut it with a scissors. You can't cut it with a straight edge. You have to, you know, use a scissor to cut it because it's very, very slippery. But I will sometimes put that underneath because it's so tough it won't chew through, you know, and it's very thin so it can fit under things. So I'll often, if I'm, if I'm using leverage to pull something out, I'll have a strip of that in my hand and put that underneath and roll it out as Camille was saying. Oh, thanks. There was one more question. I'm sorry. I have been reading and then I uh, moved on, but, um, Barrett, what are some of the um, challenges you have when you receive a piece of furniture that's upholstered? Uh, I'd say so. There's there's a couple challenges. Usually, um, the webbing has gone on the underside. It's it's usually modern jute webbing, which just does not last that long. Um, so what we recommend always is once we get the jute webbing off, um, or usually the springs have broken through the jute webbing, 
and then the seat collapses um, and the stuffing on top of the springs because it doesn't have any support underneath. So usually we'll rebuild that and um, and then put linen webbing in there, which is much stronger and will last you a hundred years. Um, it's it's a smaller uh, weave than than jute. Um, sometimes today. Um, a lot of people will use polyester webbing, which is very strong. Um, we'll do the same job. Um, and also they can use staples to put it in, which isn't going to interfere with the, um, that much with the, uh, the bottom of the seat rails, especially when they've been eaten up over the years through many different tacking campaigns. Um, but usually we're dealing with structural issues. Uh, the chair has a structural issue. And we have to remove the upholstery to get in to do what we need to do to the frame of the chair. And so a lot of the times we don't want to take off all of that upholstery. Oh. So we get into what you and Ann were talking about, removing these very difficult uh, decorative brass nails, which we never want to break. So we've made a lot of our own custom tools to sneak under those decorative mm -hmm. brass nails and, and not break them. And uh, using a lot of techniques that that you guys use as well, um, it's like Ann said, it's always that rusted <laughs> tack that's or decorative head nail that's holding that one little fiber that you're trying to put under the stereo microscope. But um, but yeah, we try to get in there, um, keep everything that's original original, and put it back together. And um, so a lot of times we'll, we'll be spent trying to talk the client out of using the chair. Um, a lot of times we'll have historic chairs with original upholstery and they'll insist on using it. And I'll try to talk them into putting it in the bedroom and just hanging sweaters over it or something, which a lot of times they'll go for, but, um, some people just insist on sitting on them. So, um, that's generally what we come upon. Barrett, can I ask you a question about filling the um, those tacking holes? So I was working on a chair that had so many holes that the the structure was compromised, and I filled it with Aerolite, but this was a, a chair that was going to be sat on, and then the staples for the upholstery did not hold in the Aerolite. Um, oh, so I got, I got the do, you, do you consolidate the wood with something else other than a bulk epoxy? So we've done it a, a couple different ways. Um, believe it or not, Michaela, years ago, we used to take little tiny pieces of um, whatever the wood was in the seat rails and actually carve them and, and glue them right into the voids where they had been you know, split apart from all attacking campaigns. But then years ago, we took an experimental approach. And um, what we did was um, we made a custom epoxy. Um, if you, you can you can change the ratio of bulk epoxies so that they will stay in different levels of softness for the life of that epoxy. And yeah. I've done that in my boat building days um, when we did that to the seam as an experiment back in the 80s on a Harishoff, 12 and a half. And it worked fabulously when the cedar planks wanted to expand when the boat got wet. It just took this soft, this epoxy that we found just the right density to it so it could it could expand and squeeze out and then when the boat dried out it would come flat again so that's what we've done and we found this this just this perfect thing that's enough to hold the nails which you know aerodite is too brittle as you found out and mm -hmm. and um and it's not too hard to nail into and i'll i'll be glad to, to tell you the the ratio and the proportion. Appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, it'll make your life a lot easier because, um, yeah, some of these chairs have just been um, to people out there who don't know what um, Michaela and I are talking about. The wood is so it's been so over nailed and underneath that there's there's really no meat left to do the the, the current. Um, well, it depends. It could be on the top of the of the chair rail, or it could be underneath where the webbing is going to go. Um, and then in poor restoration, a lot of times you'll see things like people route that out and, and put a piece of wood in there to replace all of that wood, which of course ruins the value of the chair. And it's sort of radical surgery stuff that we would never recommend, but, um, but yeah, try to keep it the way it is. And, um, and each chair is different. 
Mm-hmm. I feel your pain. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> Barrett, um, I was wondering, do you ever make internal frames to fit into more delicate pieces that say historically they want a more stable webbing structure on the top? Yes, when that when that whole technology came out, and I, I think it was in the eighties and nineties. Mm-hmm. I remember Joe Twitchell at Spinia um, was a, was an early advocate of that, and and made some beautiful um, taught me how to make beautiful um, what we call non intrusive mm-hmm. inner frames. So yeah, that is something we do. It's it's not done very often, but you explain to the client that instead of touching the original chair, we're going to take out everything and we're going to. Um, display this whole upholstery um, decoration scheme in an internal frame that's not going to interact with the original chair at all so yeah yeah using ethafoam and and yeah ethafoam can you describe what that is to make a a false seat out of ethafoam and what are the pros and cons and why might a conservator make that recommendation yeah oh, i'm oh, sorry go one. ahead no, go ahead, Barrett. No, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so ethophone seats are, um, you know, they're a tough seat if you're going to sit on your chair. They're really only for... A look. Yeah, it's a museum seat. It's a museum chair. It's something that's going to do it. It's great when you have, say a piece of upholstery that comes all the way over the rail and goes underneath. But if you have it half over the rail and then that other half is finished wood and say um, a row of decorative nails, it's sometimes hard to um, create a seamless application of ethafoam. And ethafoam itself is a closed cell polyethylene and it's um, a closed cell expanded polyethylene and, and you can carve it to fit anything. Um, I use it to make mannequins, um, mounts. And so you can carve it to fit into a seat and then you could say, put a little padding over it and then your show fabric. But how it's attached to the seat is the most difficult part. So if, if the upholstery can come all the way over and go underneath and attach, I might try and do it with Velcro, you know? if we could do that, if there's room to do that. Um, but if it's half over the rail, I have seen people make really close fit, kind of, they, they do the ethafoam, they put the padding, they put the show fabric, and then they, I saw Nancy Britton do this once and I was really amazed at it. She had it half over the rail um, and she was using a piece of dress fabric. So it wasn't as thick um, or recalcitrant as um, as the upholstery fabric would have been. So it folds in easier. So you could make an edge out of um, Nomex or Teflon or whatever it is that you're using and kind of fold it under and maybe tack it in place with two tacks as opposed to many tacks. Mm. Um, so it's it's a very, very picky thing. It's something you want to, somebody to do that really kind of understands how to get that tension to make it look like it's firm and beautiful to sit on and then um, go from there. And the shaping of the seat is is an art in itself. Oh, yeah. Uh, when you take that ethafoam and you're trying to simulate what you think the shape of that 1790, you know, federal chair looks like you have to have a lot of trial and error there to get that look that that is the right look because it's going to be in a, a museum situation where you want it to look appropriate too yeah yeah the edge rolls and and reproducing them it's it's a huge deal in unto itself and it's it's very difficult to make it look believable to people who actually study edge rolls, yeah. you know, and edge rolls are those, um, is the portion where the stuffing is filled into a roll and then um, stitching goes from one end of the roll to the other front to back and squeezes it together. And you can squeeze it all the way up to a fine point to make a French edge, that really nice flat 
deck of a chair of a seat and then it comes straight down the way the reason that's that happens is because you've got that edge roll sewn into place with many many rows of with multiple rows of stitches going all the way across from one end to the other um, and then a barrel edge roll is of course a different type it's more of a barrel it's rounded and so that can be replaced by say they used to use sedge hair um, sedge straw um, all kinds of different things as well as upholstery and again it's sewing up that edge roll and filling it with the with the horse hair and um, sewing it so that everything stays in place and that's what really gives you the structure of the seat edge, which is where most of the work happens. I don't know about you, but that was entirely over my head. Um, so, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm sorry, it's really hard to talk about yeah. edge rolls and not have one to refer to. Yeah. Hey, Anne, would you talk about um, uh, my least favorite topic, which is uh, upholstered furniture that is infested by pest? Can you tell us what that might look like, what to look for, and um, sort of how to deal with that? Yeah, so first and foremost, you really want to um, look for frass. And frass is like that little poppy seed piece. You know, that's those little poppy seed pieces that are falling down. Or say you touch the deck, the surface of the deck, and it, it has a particulate over it. The frass is basically the detritus from the, from the bugs themselves. However, there can also be inner infestation where there's generations of moths living inside or beetles living inside the upholstery. Um, and in that case, you really want to, you know, either put it in an antioxic um, chamber or um, freeze it if that's appropriate. And it depends on the chair and how what it's made of and um, how it's fabricated. Uh, freezing isn't always an option. Like a lot of these uh, chairs, like little side chairs, um, have a seat that just pops into them. And then they have a seat back that pops into them too, especially in the 18th century. Like if you could take that out and just put that portion in the freezer, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, and then another option is to deinstall and actually clean out what's going on and either replace or freeze. Um, this is gonna be my one, um, caveat I, I do recommend that people not throw out their horsehair cakes you know that inner that inner portion where all the horsehair is that horsehair cake is the shape of the seat and um it can be washed and the dirt will just shed right off of it because the fiber is such a glassy fiber and um and that is something that I refer, that I also do too. Like if I'm taking something apart and I get to the horse hair, I'll sew it up in a nylon, in a bridle net. In a, I'll sew it up in a bridle net kind of casing and then I'll throw it in the water and you'll just watch all the dirt fall out of it. And that's another thing to do. So freezing is preferred for getting rid of pests, um, but, and also I, I like to wet clean my horse hair. Once you've wet cleaned horse hair, it's the most beautiful, luxurious thing to work with. I know it's often very dirty when we're dealing with it and it looks yucky, but once it's cleaned, it's really a wonderful material and it's irreplaceable. There's nothing we can use that will give us the rebound and, um, and, the, and the surface structure to hold a shape other than horse hair. Nothing that I have found yet. I don't know, Barrett, maybe you have found some things that are good replacements for horse hair? No, it's it's like all natural materials, one of a kind, yeah. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing that replaces it. There's nothing that replaces that bound energy of having it compress and come back up, you know? Um, for those of us in the New England area, um the uh, historic New England in Haverhill has a fumigation bubble that you probably heard us talk about before. Adam Osgood is the person who is in charge of that. So um, like if uh, I have a client that says they have an infested piece of furniture, that's what I do. I go and uh, schedule something with Adam. In the meantime, I wrap that piece of furniture in very thoroughly in plastic. Clear plastic's great. You can like watch the little things. 
if you need to, and then put it in a place where you're not gonna reinfest anything else. Say you find a chair with evidence of insect damage, you can just plunk that, put it in your, your garage for a sec, you know, shake it out, wrap it up in plastic, get it to another place, and then uh, immediately clean the surroundings in that room, look for other evidence, and then uh, take it from there. It's, um, it's very often there's more than one thing that's infested. So um, be very vigilant yeah. about that and make that part of your routine check every quarter or half of a year. Integrated pest management is a whole subject unto itself. Super huge, super complex, multi types of infestation. So it's like we were talking about the infestation of the upholstery, but the chair itself can be, in, the, the wood can be infested. It's, it's so complex. Um, I really, if you think something's infested, I would contact somebody to help you decide what the appropriate course of action is. I always say that except for instances of uh, fire, water, and bugs, um, don't act immediately, talk to some people. But for those three things, especially fire, water, bugs, follow your instinct, isolate, uh, you know, and then, um, and then you can do a little bit of research. Well, we've reached one o'clock. Does anybody else have anything else to ask of Anne or Barrett? And if not. I do. I don't have yes. a question. Yeah. But I do have a warning about the uh, fumigation. When I was at the village, Ulsterbridge Village, we fumigated things regularly. Uh, but one item went out and was reupholstered. So when the curator brought it back in, well, we just thought erroneously that it would be okay. Well, the chair was okay, but the stuffing in it was old and it turned out to be infested. So it cost us a fair amount of money after we found the problem in the middle of the collection is to take out a bunch of things and have them fumigated all at one time. So just a warning, just because you think it's in good condition, it may not be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really recommend wrapping things in plastic when you find or identify or think something is um, um, infested. And, uh, you know, just go to Home Depot, get a big clean sheet of, of strong polyethylene and close that puppy up and see if anything comes out. You know, that's one way to uh, isolate very quickly if you don't have DARTEC available to you. It's, it's another option. What's DARTEC? Um, it's a polyester film, if I'm right. And they oh, wow, use yeah. it, yeah, they use it for, for paintings and packing and, you know, shipping and stuff. And, you know, sometimes you just don't have the materials there with you. Um, so you, you know, I, I have no problem with going to Home Depot and getting a clean sheet of like two or three mil polyethylene that, that can be, you know, easily wrapped over a textile or a upholstered piece and taped shut on all the seams because they just, those little buggers can get out of just about anything. And just as a quick reminder, um, flying moths, their job is just to reproduce, find each other, and then lay eggs everywhere. It's the, it's the larva of carpet beetles or moths, things like that, that uh, even like things like silverfish. It's the larva that's doing the eating. Its only job is just to hatch, mature, and reproduce. And uh, so the flying insects are, uh, could be anywhere and not necessarily in proximity to where the infestation is. But maybe we'll talk more about IPM in another talk. <laughs> maybe maybe not it's not really a great lunch time <laughs> conversation so. our, our our racks our registrars and curate um collections management folks have had a bug discussion during lunch so it would not be the first time <laughs> <laughs> okay this um, has been so much fun any other final comments well thank oh, you I so much a, a little celebratory Thank you, Nima. Thank you so much for giving us the forum to do this and to reach out to people. And you can always approach me or Barrett or anybody in the Nima office. And um, if you have specific questions for Anne, just get them to me too, and then I'll, I'll pass them on. Thanks, Anne.
Well, thank you, everybody. Wonderful meeting you all. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thank Jenna. you, Ann. Bye. 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 Hey, David, Bye. Take care, everybody. David, nice Navajo carpet. He's muted, but.